Holy Week, Maundy Thursday, Lord's Supper, Garden of Gethsemane, Easter is Easter, um, but I'm preaching Good Friday, so this is what I'm concentrating on, um, and um, and I'm sure we, I mean, you, you know what happened on Good Friday, Jesus, you know, the cross and the trial and everything that led up to that, and um, what I find very interesting, and, and Pastor Stecker often says this, what is concealed in the Old Testament is revealed in the New Testament. But at this time, what's concealed in the New Testament is revealed in the Old Testament. Um, And uh, the most detailed um, uh, description of the crucifixion, of the why of what's going on on Good Friday is found in Isaiah chapters 52 and 53. And um, that's what I what I want to cover today, uh, because in this, and I, um, I truly believe Martin Luther said this. He says if there was um, one part of the Old Testament that you could, if you were to go to a, a island and you could only take one part of the Old Testament, it would be these verses. I mean, these verses are they just they they summarize everything. Um, and uh, he, in fact, Luther and I agree, not that I've done it yet, he says, uh, every Christian should have these words memorized by heart, should have it memorized. I'm working on it. Every year I do the same thing. Oh, yeah, I should memorize that, but I'm getting there. Um, but this uh, Isaiah 52, 13 to Isaiah 53, verse 12, is what we call the fourth song of the suffering servant in the book of Isaiah. There are five songs. Now, we call them songs. They could have sung them, but they're five sections. They talk about Jesus and what he was going to do. And this is the most detailed, specifically on Good Friday, of what Jesus was going to do. Now, what's very interesting, in Jewish circles, you know, when when they gather together on Saturday for synagogue, they have assigned readings just like we do, but they just read through the Old Testament. So they'll have part they would see. Now, here, um, they would read chapter 52 to verse 12, and then they would end. And then the next week, they would start out with chapter 54. They completely skipped this section. Why? Because, we're going to get to that, because it talks about the suffering servant, the, his suffering and his dying, his being rejected. And they're going... That's not what our that's not what we want our Messiah to be. They don't know what to do with this because they don't they're going, well, this doesn't make any sense. Why what why would this all be happening? So they they literally they don't even commentators don't even comment on it in, in Jewish circles. They just kind of go, well, that's something we don't know and we're just gonna move on. Um, and so uh, and and I would even say the Apostle Paul would have agreed with that until he had his little run-in with Jesus, and then he would go, because he quotes Isaiah 52 and 53 numerous times in his letters, either directly or you can see a very indirect way that he says, and we'll, we'll get to some of these verses and, and what, how he does that. So, um, so very important part in the Old Testament to explain what's going on. Um, and so as I go through this, and we get to go till till 1030 because there's no church today (laughs) it might take me that long uh to do that so we're going to go through that and 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 i will slow down and and if you want me to but some of this you're going to see now what's very interesting with this uh and it's a prophecy but it's written about something in the future but that you're looking the looking like in the past and you can hear the words he was he was he had been he was i mean it's kind of a strange Prophecy, because usually prophecy is he will be, he's going to be. But here it was, he was. I mean, it's like it happened in the future, but it's, we're looking back like it happened in the past. Um, and so um, that we're going to have that. All right, I'm going to start with verse 13. Um, Behold, my servant shall act wisely. He shall be high and lifted up and shall be exalted. I'm going to stop there because in this part, Isaiah, the Lord, the Holy Spirit, speaking through Isaiah, is setting up the story for us. He goes, 
I want you to keep this in mind. Now, this servant, and that, and they would have really, the Jewish, they really cringe at that because they're going, servant, slave, we were servants and slave in Egypt. We don't want to go back to that. But God is setting him up and saying, in order for salvation to happen, there has to be someone who will be that slave, who will, who will give up his life, who will be that servant. And it talks about he will do it wisely, meaning he will do everything perfectly. The, it's a kind of a, uh, when you translate from Hebrew to English, you kind of lose that. So that wise everything, oh, he was, but it's, he does everything that needs to be done. So that's what that means. So we're already saying it. But then this phrase, he shall be high and lifted up and exalted one. The only time that, that those words in the Hebrew are used, it's always in connection with God. So this high and lifted up, it's, it's connected with God. So we're looking at this. This is the picture. High and exalted. So heavenly glory. So think of it that way. That this is, you know, he did wise, he did everything perfectly so that there's this heavenly glory. So, you, so we go, oh, here it is. Think of it this way, transfiguration. Remember when they went to the mountain and Jesus shone in his glory? It was kind of... Uh, God's way of, of reminding Jesus, but also telling the disciples that, you know, Jesus is going to go back to his heavenly glory. So there, here's the, we're going to get back to that point um, in that. So we, so we have this Jesus in his heavenly glory. And then the next verse, as many were astonished at you, his appearance was so marred beyond human semblance and his form beyond that of the children of mankind. So we have that first verse 12, or 13, in, oh, there's Jesus in his heavenly glory. In verse 14, it's very, the very human Jesus, meaning he's hanging on the cross. He is looking bad. I mean, he's terrible. I mean, if you read, we're going to hear about it. He's going to be flogged with, I mean, he's going to be, won't even be recognizable. So we have this first part um, that, we, that we talk about. Jesus is in his heavenly glory. And then before that happens, now we're going to go back and kind of go back in time. Here Jesus is in, 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 that, uh, uh, in his humanness. And then verse 15, it starts to tell us why this is. Why does he look the way he does? Verse 15, so he shall sprinkle many nations... Kings shall shut their mouths because of him. For that which has not been told them, they see, and that which they have not heard, they understand. Now, the word sprinkle is an Old Testament um, code word, if you want to put it that way. It has to do with sacrificial cleansings. The, in order for people to be cleansed from their sins in the Old Testament, there was the sprinkling of blood that took place. And that was the Day of Atonement. Um, that um, one of the things that God did was to show that God had forgiven them their sins, they would sprinkle blood, and so they were covered in blood so that when God would look at those people, he would go, oh, I see the blood, so there's forgiveness of sins. There's these, I no longer hold the sins against them. So we have this, and he's going to sprinkle on many nations, and the word many, uh, we can translate all. So he's going to offer this, this cleansing, this salvation to all nations open to all. Later on in the book of Isaiah, um, it's like a commentary on Matthew 28. Go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing and teaching everything, and I, you know, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. So here, Isaiah, the Lord, is setting us up saying, there, this message is going to go forth, and it's going to go to all people, because God wants all people to be saved. Um, and so we have this, this sprinkle, which means just a cleansing. Uh, kings won't be able to open their mouths. Oh, I mean, it's just kind of a, they'll, they'll, they'll be silent because of what Jesus, what the Messiah was going to do, what, what the Messiah was going to do, his suffering. In order to save people, it wasn't going to be he was going to go in and conquer people. It was as if he was conquered himself. So it's going to be opposite of what the world will think how he's going to bring salvation. He's going to allow himself to suffer punishment and death, even death on a cross, as we read in Philippians 2 last week. 
which was also a Zechariah, which talked about the river. Um, for which they have not been told they've seen and which they have not heard they understand. In other words, here, uh, the Lord speaking through Isaiah is saying, um, this thing is going to happen. It's not going to make sense to the, while this is happening. Why is Jesus hanging on the cross? And we're going to get to that as, as, as our human perspective, what's going on apart from understanding God's plan of salvation. That, and what Isaiah is beginning to say here is that we need to go tell people what this means. There's Jesus on the cross. What does that mean? What does that mean for me? But what does that mean for all people? So this whole, you know, what they have not been told, they will see, and what they do not understand, have not heard, they will understand. Then verse 1 of chapter 53. Who has believed what they have heard from us, and to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? That, and these are the questions that he's going to lead into this next section about, um, you know, and, and kind of what, what it means is, um, as they look at Jesus, and this was true of even Jesus' ministry, it didn't. It was not the way they thought God would bring salvation. If you remember, way back in the beginning of John, Jesus is gathering his disciples, and Philip and Nathaniel. Do you remember that little story? Um, uh, Jesus comes to Philip, and then. Philip goes into Nathaniel, and, and Philip says, hey, we have found the Messiah, Jesus of Nazareth. And if, do you remember what Nathaniel's response was? Nazareth? Can anything good come from Nazareth? What are you talking about you found the Messiah? The Messiah should be coming from Jerusalem, should be part of the ruling class, should be one of the main Pharisees, should be... But Nazareth, remember, Nazareth is a hick town, still is. I mean, you go there today and it, you blink and you miss it. I mean, that's kind of, so, so that's what's going on. And in fact, in verse 2, we're beginning to see this. For he grew up before him like a young plant and like a root out of dry ground. He had no form of majesty that we should look at him and no beauty that we should desire him. This Jesus was a nobody. When, when, when Nathaniel said Nazareth, what he was saying is this, well, this Jesus is a loser. He's from Nazareth. That's a loser place. And so there, you know, when, when, when he's doing that, when Pilate writes the words above Jesus on, on the cross, remember what he said, Jesus of Nazareth, king of the Jews. That was a little dig to the Jews Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus is a loser. Here's your king. Looks what happened to him. He's hanging on the cross as a condemned loser. And so we're, they're looking at Jesus, and he says, he was a young plant, a root that came out of dry ground. He's nothing. I mean, it could be easily, the majestic oak wasn't, you know, this was just a, could have been crushed. Could have been, or as we say, run over with the lawnmower, would, would never hear about him again. I mean, that kind of, giving that picture. And even going on, questions? Okay. Um, For he had no form of majesty that we should look at him and no beauty that we should desire him. It wasn't, oh, there he is, and it wasn't, you know, we, in religious art, you look at it and they got the glowing thing around the head going on. And what do we call that? The nimbus. The nimbus. That wasn't when Jesus was walking around, he didn't somebody with a flashlight underneath going, Oh, there is the you know, every time you walked in a room you heard, oh, it wasn't it was just there's Jesus of Nazareth. Oh, the son of Mary and Joseph. I mean, it wasn't anything spectacular if you just looked at him. Yes. Before when I read that verse, I got the impression that they were talking about Jesus during his suffering and his dying. Mm-hmm. Well, he was horrible to look at during that movie. But you're talking about as he was a child growing up. And this would have been his whole life. Yeah. I mean, if you think about it, he's born where? Bethlehem. In Bethlehem. But where? Yes. In a manger with a bunch of animals. I mean, 
Child Protective Services would have showed up and yanked him away. I mean, this was, you know, this, this was, you know, and, and he's like that his whole life. I mean, what, what, it, what draws people to Jesus is what? His doing what? what? Why do people come to Jesus? It was in our gospel lesson last week. The miracles on Palm Sunday, they came to see Jesus because they heard of the signs that he did. You know, Jesus performs the miracle of feeding the 5,000. They look for him the next day. And Jesus says, you didn't look for me because I'm your Messiah. You look for me because I gave you lunch. You, I did the signs. Now, that doesn't mean everybody was like that. There were some who did come to faith. And we hear that, that they came to faith. They believed that Jesus was the Messiah. I mean, the woman at the well, she says, oh, and she runs back and says, I found the Messiah. Here he is. And so we, we have that. So, and so it's not, it's just kind of, oh, there he is. I mean, he's not, not the star athlete. He's not, I mean, he's just, and for some would say, oh, he's the loser from Nazareth. I mean, that would, that, just because that would have been, you know, when Jesus is showing up in Jerusalem and he's bringing his fisherman friend with him, with them, and it's probably smelling like fishermen, they're going, of all the people that you could have chosen to be on your team, Jesus, you picked these guys? And Jesus says, I did. They're going to change the world. They're going to change the world. And so we, we have that. Now, verse 3. We're going to get now... I'm, this I'm thinking we're getting closer to Good Friday. So this you have the, you know, Jesus standing before uh, the Sanhedrin, uh, before Herod, before Pontius Pilate. And so this is kind of as we get to the cross. He was despised and rejected by man, a man of sorrows and equated with grief, as one from whom men hid their faces. He was despised. And we esteemed him not. So when Jesus is, it, it, as the trials are going on, they are trying to find, you know, things to accuse Jesus of. And they're, you know, and, and they get, you know, and they're not agreeing on their charges. Oh, he said this. Oh, no, he said it this way. And da, 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 da. You know, and, 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 and and even the, the high priest is saying, you have no, you're not saying anything to these things? And I'm thinking, Jesus going, what do you want me to say? They're all lies. I mean, how do you, I mean, the, you know, are you still kicking your dog kind of questions? I mean, how do you answer that? Then if you remember, uh, well, well, when we get to Pilate, Pilate is, uh, Pilate is kind of one of those, uh, I feel sorry for Pilate because he's kind of put in a unique position because he is the religious, I mean, he is the political leader of the day. The religious leaders want Jesus dead, so they're going to try their best. Pilate goes, this man is innocent. He hasn't done anything wrong. He tries to set him free. And if you remember, what does Pilate do with Jesus early in the morning? Who does he send him to? King Herod, because he goes, oh, he's from Galilee. Herod's in town. I'm just going to take this hot political potato and go over there. And then he, Jesus shows up to Herod, and we read Jesus says nothing. He remains silent the whole time. Now the question is, why did Jesus remain silent? Why was that? Well, let's look. What, what do we know about Herod? This is not Herod the Great, the guy who wanted Jesus dead when he was a baby. This would have been his son. Do you remember what he did? Yeah, with John the Baptist. Yes. John the Baptist told Herod what he was doing was wrong. He was living with his brother's wife as they were, like, married, but they weren't. And Herod said that was wrong, doing all that. And if you remember, you know, Herod, or John the Baptist loses his head because Herod's knee dances, oh, I'll give you anything you want up to have my kingdom. And, and, uh, and, Mom says, I want John the Baptist's head on a silver platter. And so Herod has to do that. Jesus comes. And Herod says, make do a miracle for me. My favorite part in Jesus Christ Superstar. Yeah. Just dance on the, don't do a miracle, just dance on the pool for me. Yeah. 
going to have to watch that this couple of days. Um, um, but if you remember, Jesus says nothing. Why would Jesus say nothing? I, have to, I always thought about, what, why, why did he not respond? Well, what did Herod do with the word of God that was coming to him from John the Baptist? He cut it off. He said, I don't want to hear it anymore. And God's saying, and Jesus is saying, okay, you didn't want the word of God. I'm, not, I'm giving you nothing. I'm not going to, the very word of God himself is saying nothing to Herod. Until Herod repents, God's, God is silent. God is silent. Until there's repentance from Herod's part. I just find that you kind of look at that and go, oh, but Herod, and then what does Herod do? Well, he sent him back to Pilate. And, and Pilate tries to do his best. And, and he's, he, he, while this is going on, I, I just think Jesus is having I, these words run through his mind. Okay, I'm doing this because this is the fulfillment of what's going on. Because we get to verse 4. He's sent back to Pilate. Now, Pilate says, oh, there's a tradition we have here during the Passover. I will set one of the prisoners free. Who do you want me to set free? Jesus, Mr. Innocent, whom he has nothing wrong, or Barabbas, this insurrectionist, this murderer. And who do they ask for? We want Barabbas. What do you want him to do with Jesus? Crucify him. Put him to death. But before Pilate does that, he sends Jesus away, and he's flogged. He's whipped. Beat him within an inch of his life. Just pulverize him. And, and what that would have been with the whip, and uh, we believe uh, that the end of the whip had seven or more ends to it, and it just had sharp objects in it, and it would just tear your flesh open. Now, what's very interesting is that in the Old Testament, in order to sacrifice a lamb, what did you have to do to the lamb? You had to open it up. I mean, it was just kind of Jesus was being prepared for the sacrifice. But then, then Jesus is brought back to Pilate. And if you remember, by that time, they put a robe on him and a crown of thorns. They bring Jesus to Pilate, and Pilate says, Behold the man. Pilate is shocked that Jesus is still alive. I think it's a miracle in itself, because usually you didn't survive those kind of beatings. And he's going, he's done nothing wrong. See, I have punished him. And what do they want? crucify him and so they're sitting there going surely you know and we sit there and we say he's surely born our griefs and carried our sorrows so those whippings was really for who oh, us yet what did we do we esteem him stricken smitten by god and afflicted we they looked at jesus we were looked at jesus and saying see God has it out for him. God is punishing him for something that he did. In reality, Jesus did nothing wrong, but it's your sins and mine that Jesus is being whipped for. I think of it this way. Every sin that you have ever committed, ever committed, piece of paper, tattooed, whatever, is on Jesus. So that when God the Father is looking at Jesus and Jesus is being whipped, he's being whipped for your sin. Just your sins. Oh, and your sins. And, your, and my sins. And Jesus took that all upon himself. What's very interesting, um, when Jesus is performing, and it was in Luke's gospel, that um, uh, Jesus even said, you know, he's healing all these people, and he quotes Isaiah about I've, I've taken upon their illnesses and their sicknesses. Upon, I'm taking their sins upon myself. As I said, at the baptism of Jesus, at our baptism, our sins are washed away. At Jesus' baptism, our sins are now being placed upon Jesus. So that Jesus, when we get to Pilate, when you get to that part, he, is, he is, has all the sins of all time for all people, and he's being punished for those sins. So that when God the Father is looking on Jesus and sending his wrath down, yes, there's Jesus there, but what he sees is your sins and mine. And Jesus is underneath him and holding it up. 
and say, okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take it all. I'm going to hold it. And we're going to sit there, and we're sitting, and they're going, see, he deserves this. He, does, he did something wrong. And, of course, they blame Jesus for blasphemy, calling himself God. Well, he is God, but they, oh, that was the sin that they said. That's what it was. Um, and they have that. Verse 5. Now, I, I didn't mention this, but as you can see, the verbs, was, was, was. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement, the judgment that brought us peace, and with his stripes we are healed. So all of that happened for us. We read in the gospel, and, and um, Good Friday we're going to read the account from John's gospel and then Mark's gospel, and we're, we see, and we, we know the story, and we're watching that. We know the, we have the how, we have the where, and the when, and the what, but we don't have the why. I mean, this is giving us the why this is happening to Jesus. And he's doing that for you and for me. He's making it happen so that uh, we have um, salvation. Um, verse 6. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. Uh, Paul quotes that in Romans. This, uh, that we like all sheep. Meaning um, that phrase, like all sheep, that, that, that's our sinful nature. Left to ourselves... Wolf, we're going to do. We're going to want to do our own thing. Left to ourselves, being simple human beings, what are we going to want to do? Sin. I mean, we can't change. We can't change our simple human nature. We can't get rid of it by ourselves. But yet, what does Jesus do? What does he do? The Lord has laid upon him all our iniquity, all our sins, are placed upon Jesus without us even knowing about it. I mean, because of our sinfulness, original sin, as we read in, in Ephesians chapter 2, you were dead in your trespasses and sins. You know, you're an enemy of God. All that goes along with that. From Lent 4, B. My third most favorite Sunday of the church here. That, that phrase of what's going on. Because we, God has to come to us first. And so we have all this. So we're looking at the crucifixion and we're going, why is that happening? And we can go, because that's for us. Jesus is dying because of us. Because he loved us so much that he willingly take up, took upon himself his own, our sins. Verse 7. He was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. Like a sheep that is led to the slaughter, and like a sheep that before its shears is silent, when he, uh, he opened not his mouth. So we have this, you know, doesn't really say anything. He doesn't say anything for Herod. He doesn't really respond to the Sanhedrin when they bring the charges. I mean, he does not. Usually when someone is condemned to death during those times in Roman circles, usually if you hear the phrase, kill him, you're going to respond, no. I mean, but Jesus doesn't do that. He says nothing. He just, he, he just, he's letting it happen. Because he's in charge. I mean, he's making, he knows exactly what's going on. Um, verse 8, by oppression and judgment, he was taken away. And it's for his generation who considered that he was cut off of the land of the living, stricken for the transgressions of my people. In other words, people are going, he, he's on the cross because he did something wrong. But we know he did nothing wrong. Why? Who is he hanging on the cross for? You and me. For we did the wrong. So that we, you know, you know, someone outside going, why is that happening? Why? why? And so we're explaining he's, he's not doing it for himself. And they made his grave with the wicked and with the rich man in his death. Um, technically... Uh, when you were crucified on a cross, Roman crucifixion, uh, they would leave your body up on the cross for days and animals would just come, birds would just come and eat you. And then they would take your body, take it down, and then they would toss it with the others. Now, one of the names of the places 
that Jesus, Jesus died on Mount Calvary. He died on Golgotha, but it was also called the place of the skull, which made reference to all the skull heads that were sitting there. So that you know, it was when you were tossed with the it, with the rest of the bodies, you were you were considered cursed because you didn't have a proper burial. But what happens with Jesus? He does. He does. Mm -hmm. And with the rich man. Mm -hmm. I mean, that would have been, I mean, if you're sitting there and you know and you know Isaiah 53, and you're going, wait a minute, he should be over there. How did he end up in a tomb over here? And that was this fulfillment that a rich man, I mean, never used before, Joseph of Arimathea had it hewed out. He had it carved out. I mean, that took a lot of money. And yet, that's where Jesus ends up. He ends up in the tomb. The very, I mean, if that's, if this is the only verse I had to prove that Jesus is the Messiah, was the fulfillment of this, that he didn't, was not cursed, throwing his body in the pile of bones, but he ended up in a tomb. I mean, we think that, we take that for granted. Oh, well, of course, you put him in a grave, you put him in a tomb. That was not the case. You would have been tossed over and cast with the other, the cursed people. Um, and so, so we, we have that. Although he had done no violence and there was no deceit in his mouth. In other words, peaceful, humble Jesus. I mean, that's kind of, yet, and this is important, yet it was the will of God, of the Lord to crush him. He has put him to grief. Uh, when his soul makes an offering for sin, he sees his offering and he shall prolong his days. The will of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. So, whose will was it for this to happen? It was God's. If you remember, that we'll go all the way back to Genesis chapter 3. After Adam and Eve fell into sin, God comes and he says uh, to Satan, um, Cursed are you, da 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 da. Uh, he's going to crush your head, yet you're going to bruise his heel. Of course, the rest of the Old Testament, getting up to Jesus, what does that mean? What do you mean, crushing head, bruising heels? Well, that's the, that's going to be Jesus dying on the cross. It was the Lord's will. It was God. This was part of the plan of salvation, that Jesus was going to be the suffering servant who willingly died and rise again. Um, and so, so we, we have it. And because, because this was the... And this offering for sin, this is very interesting. Um, there, there are five or six offering, Old Testament sacrifices or offerings that were done. And the offering for sin um, was the shedding of blood. I mean, there had to have been the shedding of blood to cover one's sins. Um, and so, I mean, this is not by accident that they used this phrase. Um, but then he said... You know, um, he will see his offspring and he will prolong his days. Who is Jesus' offspring? We are the church. We are his brothers and sisters. And because of this offering for sin, not his sin, but our sins, our, our sins are covered by his blood. And so um, that, that's, that's when it end this prosper in his head, meaning that this fulfillment will happen, that Jesus will suffer and he will die, and we're going to hear he's going to rise again. Out of the anguish of his soul he shall see and be satisfied. By knowledge shall the righteous one, my servant, make many to be accounted righteous, and he will bear their iniquities. So right here in verse 11, we have... The reason why he does that, so that we can be declared righteous. We are declared justified because of what Jesus did. Only what Jesus did. We can't earn our salvation. We can't do enough, purchase enough, whatever words you want to put in there. But he did it so that we have justification, so that we are justified, um, declared righteous, forgiveness. Now, all those words can go together um, because he did that for us. Because he, is, he shall bear our iniquities. 
he took our sins upon himself. If you remember, on the Day of Atonement, and I mentioned this, part of it was the sacrificial lamb where they spread the blood, but the other thing they did was the scapegoat where the high priest would put his hand on transferring all the sins of the people on this other goat, and they would lead the goat away from the people. And by the time you get to um, the building of the temple, it literally meant that they would lead the lamb from the city, from the temple outside the city gate to show that sins were taken away. Where was Jesus crucified? Outside the city gates. So kind of that. In verse 12, so what is he going to do? Therefore, I will divide him a portion with the many, and he will divide the spoil with the strong. What is the, what is the portion? What is the treasure that's given to us? Heaven. It's heaven. Forgiveness, eternal life, salvation. Because Jesus did this perfectly, he earned it. And yet, what does he do with it? He gives it to us. Because he poured out his soul to death and was numbered with the transgressors. That's the reference to Jesus dying on the cross, and he's between two thieves. There, I mean, that's, in fact, I think John, later on, he quotes this. He says, oh, there, there it is. There's the fulfillment of the transgressors. Yet he bore the sin of many, all, and made intercession for the transgressors. Now, I mentioned some of it was past tense verbs. He was, he was, he was, he was. Some of them are present tense and some are future tense. Here we have, I say present and future. He makes intercession for the transgressors. Who are the transgressors? You and me. And what is Jesus? Well, where is the first place that where we hear Jesus? What are the first words out of Jesus' mouth on the cross? I should say that. Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. And then Jesus, what does he do now in heaven? He's praying for you and for me. So he does. The advocate, the intercessor, the prayer, prayer, -er, um, that he would do that for you and for me. And so we have, we have this going on. Now, in here, and I didn't, and I, and I want, because I want to go back to it, because it's kind of the, the sequence of the order of the story, Jesus Suffers and dies on Good Friday. They place him in the tomb. He rises on what day? Three days later, on Sunday. So the women are going to go. I always love the story of Mark. They're along the way. The women ask, who's going to roll away the stone for us? Huh, good question. They get there, the stone's rolled away. She's not there. So the resurrection happens. Here, about the, in verse 9, um, they talk about the grave of the wicked and with the rich man in his death. He's placed in there in the sense that there's the tomb and then part of the, in the Hebrew, there's a sense that he comes out of the tomb. It doesn't really say here in the English, but this, he's placed in the tomb and he's going to come out of the tomb, meaning there's, there's a, a resurrection there as well. Um, of course, you could use the last one and makes intercession for the transgressors. If you're dead, you can't pray. A lot of people pray. So you have that as well. So you, you just have this beautiful, you know, you know, this whole, and guess what I'm preaching on on Good Friday? There's some other things I didn't tell you, but I will add to it. Because you still have to come on Good Friday. <laughs> I'm doing that. So, any questions on that? How are you ever going to get this in? Oh, I'm not. <laughs> I'm, some things I'm not going to say. I did this about three years ago. I went back and looked at my notes, and I went, yeah, I, I, what, what was I thinking? That, really? So, you know, my sermon title, he was, dot, 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 so you can be, dot, dot, dot. So it was, he was, he did all that so that we can be, so that when we... And, and my hope is this, is that, one, you will learn why he was, why he did all that for you, so you can be, but also that you can take that news, that good news, and when someone asks you, why did Jesus sign the cross? Well, he was, so that you can be, so that you too can have this gift. So that's kind of my hope with my message. 
a both and. Usually when people come on Good Friday, they already know the end of the story. I mean, that's the, and that's why I said at the beginning of the, in chapter 52, verse 13, he starts with, there he is in glory. He's going to go to that, implying he's going to go, he's going back to that glory. So it's kind of, we know the end of the story, kind of things like that. You know, as a, um, you know, on Sunday, because of a choir concert, we recorded the Michigan basketball game. And we, and, but I knew the score at halftime. So we're watching it. My wife says, this is so much better watching this when you know how it's going to end. <laughs> we're watching it last night. We're going, wish we knew how it ended because uh, not, not anymore. I don't really care to know how it ended now, but, but we do that. Or you watch a movie, you know, and you know how the end of the, you're going to watch the movie again. You know how it's going to end. You kind of, oh. And then, then, you, then you're looking for a little, oh, here's a sign for that, and oh, here's a sign for that, and here's a sign for that. Like I mentioned, my children, my boys, are watching Back to the Future. You know that movie? It came out in the mid-'80s. I remember watching it, and now I'm watching it. They're watching it for the first time. I'm watching it for whatever, how many times. I'm going, oh, that's reference to the third movie. And my wife says, shh, don't say anything. I said, did you see? She goes, I know. That's pretty cool. I didn't know that the first time I watched it, but now I know. Did you have another question? Okay. Yes. Um, it's not in any of this reading, but on Good Friday, when Jesus was on the cross, he says, Father, why have thou forsaken me? Yes. That's Did his father actually well, really it wasn't, he doesn't say Father. He says, my God, my God, why have you forsaken yeah. me? It's okay. Psalm 22. That's the other Psalm. If you're giving me, you know, if I could have two parts, Psalm 22, Isaiah 52 and 53. In there, it's very interesting because he first, he says, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. We go through. And if you remember from noon till three, what's happening over the face of the earth, the land? It is dark. It is, dark. It is pitch black, meaning can't even see in front of your face. In the Old Testament, when that happens, it, it was a sign of God's judgment upon people. First time we really hear about that is in Exodus with the plague of darkness that God brings upon the Egyptians, but he doesn't bring it upon the Israelites. So, you, And every once in a while, you, he, there's a reference, to, or God makes it happen that in the middle of the day, it's pitch black, oh, God's judgment on us. In the midst of that darkness, Jesus says, he doesn't say my father, he says, my God, my God, my, and why, what happened? What, why is that different? I mean, when Jesus prayed early on, you know, can you let this cup pass from me? I don't think he's talking about the suffering, all that. I don't think that wasn't, I think what he really didn't want to happen was that God the Father literally had to turn his back on his son. So God's wrath eternal wrath Jesus had to bear for the sin for your sins and mine so that Jesus was totally alone the only one so his father did. he did he would have he would have but but the father did that to Jesus so that he would never have to do that to you and to me I was going to say because his father was the one that sent him as we read here, it was the Father, it was the Lord's will to make that happen. Yes. And Jesus so. knew that. Jesus knew that that was going to, I think that's when Jesus says, is there any other way? But not my, I think he's talking about that particular moment where he would have to work, the love between God the Father and the God the Son ceased for that moment. However, how long that was, I have no idea. But Jesus was feeling the whole wrath, punishment of God God, of his heavenly, of his father, because of our sins, so he's totally alone. To I mean, just he's bearing it all by himself, and he's saying, "Why, God, why have you forsaken me? Why, my God, my God, Eli, 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 Eli. And of course, what do the people say? Oh, wait a minute, we think he's calling for Elijah. I'm going. You don't even. You're so blinded by your unbelief that you don't even know what Psalm 22 is, because later in the Psalm it says that God does come. And comfort him. It does, by the end of the psalm, while David writes it, why have you forsaken me? David at the end says, oh, you haven't forsaken me. You're always there. But yes, 
God the Father literally turned his back on his son. So that was God, he knew he, yes. that was going to happen. That was going to happen. That's going to happen. Yeah. You know, and you're going, and you wonder how, how, we have no idea how bad it was. We have no idea. Because we can't, we can't fathom that. And I, I don't even want to imagine what that would be like. I mean, my love for my children, I, they could do the worst of the worst. And I'm going, I'm still going to love them. But, and, and we think it was hard on Jesus. Could you imagine the father saying, I, my love for you, my love for, for you that's been from eternity, that stops. I can't love you. All, all I can show you is my wrath, my anger, my hatred. We can even say that. The hatred for the sin that Jesus was bearing. So that's what Jesus was asking. Yes. He, he dreaded that. He didn't. Part. Right. And, and many times we, we say, why, when we say, when we say, why has God forsaken me? Has God forsaken you? No. no. We say it in doubt. Jesus was not saying in doubt. It literally happened that he was forsaken by God, that he, God, the Father. I can't even look at you anymore. It's so bad. Those, that's, that's what it is. So that we would never have to experience that. Jesus, and it's one of those little things that we kind of, and what's very interesting that Jesus cries out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? What happened? Did God respond? It was total silence. I mean, nothing. You know, for my children, the, the worst punishment that I could give my children when they were growing up was sending them to their room and not talking to them. They would rather have me, you know, pat on their butt behind than, the, I mean, we want that, you know, what's the worst thing your loved one and they just shut up and you're going, talk to me. But that was God's will, like you said. They knew that. I, 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 I think from eternity, here's the plan. This is what's going to happen. I know. He created them knowing. Exactly. Exactly. I mean, it wasn't God in his foreknowledge knew that this was going to happen. He does it anyways. And Jesus says, they have a committee meeting. All right, who wants to go be the sacrificial lamb? I will. I'll do it. I'll let me. Pick me, pick me, pick me. Okay, you're the one, Jesus. Why are you doing it, Jesus? Because... I love you. Wow. I don't know if I love other people that way. He does. He did. Still does. So, just, you know, this, this passage from Isaiah, it, it just, and I just barely scratching the surface with this. I mean, I could spend, I think the next time I do a midweek, I might just tear this apart. I mean, just do the, all of this, just kind of those different, and where are the references in the New Testament that make reference to this, how it is fulfilled, and things like that. Of course, I say that, and I'll forget it and do something else. But All right, any other questions? I'm done in an hour-ish. All right, no class next week, but we'll meet the week after, whatever April, whatever that is. With that, all right? Let's close with the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen.